morning, good morning, San Bernardino, Riverside, the Inland Empire, Rancho Cucamonga. I love saying Rancho Cucamonga and Loma Linda, California. And good afternoon and good evening to those listening to us on the live stream link. This is the Kathleen Wells Show. I'm Kathleen. And I'm going to do something a little different, a little uncharacteristic this morning. I'm going to bring on my guest immediately because I'm delighted to have him today. Uh, one can ask for a better guest than Dick Gregory. Uh, Dick Gregory started his career as a comedian and soon thereafter, uh, rather immediately thereafter in the 60s, he expanded his career title to civil rights activist. Mr. Gregory was on the front lines in the 60s during the civil rights era with a deep and real commitment and continues today to be a drum major for justice and equality. He's the author of many books. His most recent is his second autobiography, Callous on My Soul, which updates his first autobiography autobiography. The controversial title is The N-Word. I don't, I don't know. Can I say that on the radio? I'm not sure. I might ask him about that controversial title, The N-Word, which was published in 1963 and sold over 7 million copies. Most recently, Dick Gregory has protested against BP, British Petroleum, and was arrested uh, because uh, he was protesting BP's refusal to pay out claims as promised. Also, he um, uh, decided to start fasting regarding the death penalty and spoke at Troy Davis' funeral. So thank you, Mr. Gregory, for taking the time to speak with me this morning. Hello. Yes, I'm here. I hear you. You hear me? Well, well, thank you very much for, for speaking with me this it's afternoon where you are, isn't it? Thank you, yes. And again, let me say peace and love to you and to the family, and a happy holiday to you and all your listeners. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you, and happy holidays to you and yours. Well, you know, I told a friend of mine that I was going to have you on as a guest, and he remembered buying an album that was released in the early 60s. And you had on that album, you had a piece titled, uh, 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 We Wonder Where Has All the Gold gone. You said in that piece that we're buying our cars from Japan, we're walking on Italian marble, we're eating Canadian bacon, we're smoking Cuban cigars, we're walking on Persian rugs, we're wearing Swiss, Swiss, Swiss watches, eating imported, imported olives, drinking French wine uh, and Scotch whiskey, and we wonder where has all the gold gone. You know, I'm paraphrasing. It's a funny bit, sure. but talk to me. How do you think things have changed since you made that? Well, let me let me just tell you that, that that's very important because when your soul and your spirit is lost, then you have to look for prestigious things to fill them back up. And so, when you become invisible to yourself. Uh, then you have to do things to make yourself visible. I have 10 children and 12 grandchildren and, and one great-grand, and when you're not paying them attention, they start knocking. They start beating on the baby bed. They start making you see me. In the early days of black folks in America, when we was invisible to all white folks in America, and that's why we knew so much information, because if I was the maid or the butler, they didn't see me. If I was the shoe shine boy, they didn't see me. So they said things that they wouldn't say in front of people. And that's why we had so much knowledge. We was the Pullman pullers. We heard rich white folks talking about what's fixing to happen, what the stock market was going to do. And a lot of black folks back then become multimillionaires because of information we had because we was visible. You had another group of black folks that would wear alligator, red alligator shoes, a, a pink shirt, a green hat, and orange socks, and everybody would laugh at us. <laughs> In order to laugh at me, you have to see me. Mm-hmm. That's what that was about. Mm-hmm. We put gold in our mouth. Wasn't nothing wrong with our teeth. And if you notice, the ones that had the gold, you older folks that's listening, they were dark complexed African Americans. Every now and then you had pimps and hustlers like Malcolm X that had gold or or prostitutes that had gold. That was sporting life. Mm-hmm. But the gold was there. And let me tell you how clever this is. That we know that white folks love gold and diamonds and everybody love it. So I put it in the front of my mouth 
And I grinned. If you find the people with the gold, they was always laughing, hoping you see the gold which you love before you see this black that you don't like. So all of that is survival. All of that is an unconscious survival. And so when you start looking at us with the foreign cars and the foreign this and the foreign that, that was to get you to see me. I'm not aware of it. That was a status symbol. Nobody bought a bad foreign car. Nobody bought a cheap foreign car. The, the Beetle, I mean, that was like known all over the world. Everybody's talking about it. So that's what that was about. Oh, so you're saying that we as a people, black folks, bought expensive things because we wanted to be noticed because otherwise we were invisible. No, 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 no. I'm saying we as black folks bought flashy things, not necessarily expensive. The alligator shoes was when most of them was imitations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. White America and America started buying those expensive things. So you could see me. I was numb. I had nothing in my heart. I lost my spirit. I lost my religion. Everything. That's all Americans, black and white. That's what that was about. Mm -hmm. I wasn't comfortable. You know, they talk about the grass is always greener on the other side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so nobody, nobody said, hey, Dick got a, a brand new Chevy. Hey, man, he got a Volkswagen. He got this. He got that. That's what that was about. Oh, I see. Because I thought it was a commentary on our economy. The fact that we're buying everything. It was a commentary on our economy, but I'm seeing now when I look yeah. back at it. Right, right. It was the same thing when black folks was buying, you know, the alligator shoes and the red shirt and the orange hat and the purple tie. Right, In right. order to laugh at me, you have to see me. There's a numbness inside of us. And then we didn't see this other piece coming when we looked at the graffiti. I mean, if you just, I'm just going to ask you a question, and it's, it's a silly question. Who do you think was painting graffiti on the wall, young folks or older folks? Oh, I would definitely think young folks. All right, now I'm saying this for a reason. Who's in there in the Occupy movement? Basically young folks or old folks? Well, I think it's a, it's mostly young folks, but okay, you've got no, no, older no, folks, I No, seen. no, I know we always have that. I, I'm, I'm just asking you a question real quick so you right. punt it back. Young folks. Right. All right? Mm -hmm. Who 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 do the army draft in? Young folks, they might draft in one or older folks. Right, young folks. Is young. Yeah. All right, I say that to say this. It was the young folks putting the graffiti on the wall. Uh -huh. And if you went around the world, all graffiti looked alike. If it was in French and Japanese and Chinese, it all looked alike. Then one day you're driving down the highway and you see graffiti on the bridge, right? Mm-hmm. And nobody said, wait a minute, how did that get on the, the bridge? I mean, if the state is going to paint the bridge and put a new screw in the bridge, they shut the highway down. Uh, they warn you at such and such a time, there's going to be one lane. They have state troopers out there. How does that graffiti get on the bridge? Mm -hmm. And then all at once, graffiti left, right? Mm -hmm. And then tattoos start showing up. See that transition? Huh? Young folks. You see no old folk, 90 years old, with no damn tattoos on. The young folks been yelling out and screaming out, and nobody would listen. And now I think it might be too late. Well, and, and, and I want to talk to you about whether or not it's too late, because we've got Occupy Wall Street going on now, and you saw what happened to the kids at UC Davis campus, right? Yes. So what do you, you know, and I saw you on Lawrence O'Donnell's program talking about that. You know, during the civil rights era, you saw black kids getting water hoses sprayed on them and dogs being let loose on them and the police beating them. But now it's not just black kids. It's not black. It's basically white kids having pepper sprayed in their face. What are your thoughts about that? Well, first, let's go back. I, I spoke to the Occupy Wall Street folks the second week they were there. And the big question they was asking, what can we learn from the civil rights movement? I mm -hmm. said, nothing. Nothing at all. You know, to be war and white in America, be you rich, poor, tall or short, educated, undergrad, you're born with 300 years of white privilege. You don't have to know that to be born with it. You know, a friend of mine who I hired to work for me, and I told him that, and he said, no, 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 man. That's not. I said, look, light-complected Negroes is born with a privilege. If you look at 80 years of professional sports, 99% of all black 
professional athletes was dark complected and from the south. Okay. Because mm-hmm. if you was light complected, you didn't have to pin your hopes on outrunning God with a football. Mm-hmm. Now, all the folks who upstairs who run the stuff, the teams, the sports teams, they knew that all of them black men, dark complected from the south, black professional sports have had sex with white women because of their Southern mentality, they wouldn't flaunt them. Mm-hmm. When Jackie Robinson came through and they had to bring him through to break into baseball, they realized that Jackie Robinson was born in, 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 in Alabama, but when he was one month old, his family moved to, to, to L.A. area. So he didn't have that Southern mentality. That's why they put in his contract he wouldn't date a white woman for three years. You see, we just look at this and just think, no, no, there's a there's a madness behind it, and the people who run it, most of them understand. Uh, have you ever bit your tongue? Mm-hmm. You know how bad that hurts, right? Right, right. We didn't see these white children sticking five, six, ten screws in their tongue, and they wasn't taking painkiller, okay? Yeah. Okay? What does that mean? That's universal law. Anytime I start inflicting pain on myself... Mom and Dad, y'all better watch out because you make okay and so and so, and so, consequently, to get back to the question you asked, so I tell them, you know you can't if the most powerful man a person in the world today is the President of the United States, mm-hmm. any president, so Obama's the most powerful human being on the planet today. He can't go to New York by himself and stand on a corner next to a wine old drug addict white third grade dropout murder that just broke out of jail and get a cab. They'll run him down trying to pick up that white boy. <laughs> white privilege, huh? You don't you're think the most... they'd recognize Obama? <laughs> no, 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 no. You're not listening to me. That's what I said by himself. Just oh. go there and stay in as an African American. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right? Right. He can have ten billion dollars in his pocket. He don't have to be Obama. Right, right. He can be a black person with twelve PhDs and ten billion dollars in the bank, and it's gonna happen. And when we in America stop playing that game and believe you can educate your way or money your way out this thing, you cannot do that at all. Mm-hmm. It don't work. And so I was saying to them young white folks there, you can't pattern yourself after our movement because you come with three hundred years. A white privilege. Let's take an example. Before King was killed, he was getting ready to do the poor people's campaign. Mm-hmm. Okay? Nobody. That don't threaten nobody, poor people's campaign. Most people who's poor don't, don't, don't recognize themselves as being poor. These white folks came there and said, take back, huh? D.C. See the difference in the name? Take back D.C.? Mm-hmm. Huh? Poor people's campaign? Huh? We shall overcome someday. That don't threaten nobody. If I ask you, can I borrow ten thousand dollars from you? I pay you back someday. You ain't gonna give it to me. <laughs> King got gunned down because his attitude was today, not someday. And so, what King was killed for wasn't killed over civil rights or human rights or segregation. King was killed because he became the first black person in the history of America to get in a position to determine public policy. That's what he was killed about. And so to go back to these youngsters, it's Occupy, 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 Wall Street. I was a little boy growing up. Every time I saw the word Occupy, I went to the movie. It was a mighty nation, Occupying a, occupying a poor nation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Listen to the words. They are not Negro words. They're not words that come out of oppression. These are words of oppressed people, but they have a different mentality. And so, and so consequently, there's a whole new ball game. When I was a little boy, I had a white police chief, uh, 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 white people ran the all-black Negro school, white cops. Hollywood was white. And, and uh, I go to an all-black church and see a white Jesus <laughs> and a white Mother Mary. White folks saw people in charge who looked like them. Huh? That's why people from the Caribbean, dark folks, can come in and do better than American Negroes. Why? 
because as poor and as messed up as they were down there, they did see black folks in charge. We didn't. Mm -hmm. And so all together, there's a whole different, you know, mentality. It's like when they say N-word, that's an insult to me. I don't even do shows that discuss it. That's an insult. One day, if men feel bad the way we have raped women, and those of us that didn't sit by and didn't say nothing, and so we're going to have women to change the word to the R word, that's an insult. Can you imagine our Jewish brothers and sisters being stupid enough to let some non-Jews decide that we're not going to use the word swastika no more. We're going to call it the S word. In the concentration camp, we can call it the C word. Not one black person sit at the table to determine that that word would not be used no more. Mm -hmm. Jesse Jackson wasn't there. I wasn't there. Nobody was there. Well, why did that word get switched, and why were we stupid enough to go along with it? The word got switched because of the O.J. Simpson trial. There are millions of people that believe O.J. Simpson did that. And they believe because of Mark Furman's racist statements and the use of that word is the why he was free. So somebody decide we're going to get rid of it. We black folks are stupid enough to go along with it. If I was in Russia today and I saw uh, so-and-so shot somebody because they call them the N-word, and I look up the N-word, it's the 14th letter in the alphabet, I would think that person that did the shooting had to be stupid. But it's a funny thing. When Governor Perry got in trouble, a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. about that, uh, that 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 lodge his family was renting. Exactly. That said, nigger head. The right. L.A. Times didn't say the N word head. NBC <laughs> didn't say the N word head. The Washington Post that broke the story didn't say the N word head. Uh -huh. Well, how come I got to behave, but they don't? Huh? I, I mean, mean you raised so many issues, right? You just raised so many issues. I'm com because I wanted to ask you about your book title, your first autobiography, would you still use that today? Because it's so offensive and a negative connotation to today it is to use that word. They used to say gays was offensive, so that's how come they had to hide. They used to say black folks was offensive, that's how come I had to hide. Huh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They used to say ugly people was offensive, so let's hide them. They used to say people with mental problems was offensive, and then when the civil rights bill come through, huh? Because and it's when, just a word, when right? Kennedy got on TV and admitted he had a sister that's been in a mental hospital all her life. Then it becomes fashionable for people to send their children to schools that had a psychiatrist on the staff, huh? Mm -hmm. And then it becomes fat. Oh, I can't do it Thursday having an appointment with my psychiatrist. You don't hide nothing away. You don't hide nothing away at all. And so consequently... When the gays came out the closet, they could start getting jobs that they would never, ever get before. Mm -hmm. And when women said, no, 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 we're not going to tolerate this no more. When I was a little boy, I'm 80 years old. When I went to school, a woman school teacher couldn't be married. Huh? If you was worth $10 million, you couldn't go buy a car unless your father, your brother, or your husband signed off for you. Okay? And then all at once, the women's movement came through and said, no, 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 no. Not no more. And then things change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't know another group of people would be stupid enough as we black folks. We didn't invent that word. Huh? If I say right now all you hoes listening stand up, you get mad. You upset. I didn't call your name. Why are you claiming something? Huh? Mm -hmm. Why are you claiming something that you're not? Mm -hmm. If somebody calls you that word, you get upset. But they say, hey, billionaire. You don't get upset. How can you be so sure you'll never be a billionaire? So I've got doubts about can you be that word. Huh? Mm -hmm. That's something wrong. And so consequently, when you sit and you look at it, you know, I said, I'm going to do nigger. And I said, dear mom, whenever you hear this word, remember they just advertise in my book. Right. You take it out of the closet and you hang it up and you get you take the sting out of it, huh? Mm -hmm. And then the next one, I said, up from nigger. That was my next book. And then when one day when it's all over, my last book will be nigger no more. <laughs> but you know, and but I think when the hip hop guys are using it, they don't. They mean it in an offensive way sometimes. No, you know, you ask them. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Don't ask me. Right. Ask them. How did they? How did they mean it? 
you know, it's like, you know, we always pick on the weak folks, or we mm-hmm. pick on the we pick on the the, the hip hoppers, uh, right. bitches and hoes and all that. But I don't see nobody talking about them drug pushers standing on the corner. Mm-hmm. We pick on young black folk by wearing their pants below their butt. But when white folk go to a football game with 100,000 people, halftime they get naked and run all the way across the field, they call that streaking. huh? Mm-hmm. But when I do it, all, all those black folks in the church, and they want to get together and say, wait a minute, they had a black uh, politician in New York City took out a $42,000 billboard ad in, 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 uh, in Times Square showing black folk with their pants. Lord, I say, I bet you never put up a billboard black brother showing a cop beating up some black folks. I bet you never take out a, a ad in New York City showing drug pushers standing on the corner. Huh? This is what you, you we can pick on the weak and there's not, nothing they can do about it. The worst music I ever heard wasn't no hip hop. It was black blues. We the only group of men on planet Earth. They sing derogatory words about my woman. I caught my baby in bed with my best friend. One, two, three, four, give me some more. Shake your money maker. Anytime somebody says shake your money maker, what? They're talking about your vagina. All right, when you make money with it, you a hoe. But that don't bother black folks. Men and women dance to it. But listen to a hillbilly music. You know, if he ever said anything derogatory about that lady he's living in the trailer with. All he says, baby, I'm sorry. Well, no, Please I think that's definitely me. true, that that we say bad things about us, black women. That no, black but women. I'm saying nobody attacks it. Nobody, I, the blues? I grew up where everybody thought took pride in blues. Yeah. And I listen to that crap, and I said, I want to know what is this about. Hey, I'm a black man. Between me and the black woman, I'm the most trifling one in this crowd, but my songs don't reflect that. Mm-hmm. Huh? That's all I'm saying. So why do you think that is, though? Because when you come through oppressed, huh? you see, anytime you accept injustice, you become unjust. Anytime you go along with filth, you become filthy. Mm-hmm. One instruction that I give my grandchildren, I said, I send somebody by to pick you up and, and drive you past a paper mill. Have you ever been driving in your car? The highway and pass the paper mill? No. Smell the stink. You should do that. Mm-hmm. There is no stink like a paper mill, except the people who work there don't smell it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We live with this filthy, vicious, ungodly, unspiritual wench for so long. We don't smell America's stink, so we part of it. Mm. You know, it's like I work in a, 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 a garbage. I collect garbage all day long, and then I go there and I work in a packing house, and then I come to your house for a Thanksgiving party, and all I do is go home. I don't take a bath or wash up. I just can't change clothes, and everybody in the party wonder who that is, and they're stinking, including me. Hmm? America have never washed and took a shower of her racist, sexist filth. You know, we talk about black folks. This boy burned white women at the stake, and all he had to do was call them up. Which he didn't have no trial for. He, this is the woman came over on the boat with him. I mean, you know, this all sounds so dismal. Is there any hope? Well, you know, I'm examining American. You ask them for hope. You go to the doctor, they give you an examination. They give you then they just say, <laughs> why America will never make it. We always looking for hope, and the people who ask for hope don't qualify to fix it. <laughs> I have one of the brilliant minds in the world. I cannot help America get to Mars. But I got enough sense. If I inherited General Motors in the morning, I got enough intelligence and wisdom to go out and bring in the best people money can buy, and we can turn that company around. We so busy want to know what we can do and the damn thing you can do. That's like a man want to know, can I feel the pain of your labor? Can I feel the pain of you, of you having a bit? No. But we well, want things to be better, no? Huh? We cannot continue to uh, sort of wallow in this negative cesspool. It ha- we have to believe that it can change or get you better. Believe it all you want, dear. You can go to bed and I believe in you a millionaire. You can go to bed and I believe in Mars Christmas. That's jive, baby. There's universal law. You can believe that 12 noon today is midnight and midnight is 12 <laughs> noon and it's not going to happen, okay? We keep looking for shock jive ways out. So we can go to bed. Mm-hmm. I went to Europe 
for a, a rally against capital punishment, right? Round trip, first class. They took my tax money off my ticket and bought bombs and, and ammunition and drop on women and children all over the world. So when they fall on me and my grandchildren, I just look up the sky and say, even time, baby. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. Every time you go buy a loaf of bread, you participate in this bill. Every time you buy a turkey to celebrate Thanksgiving, <laughs> that tax money, participate in this bill. Okay? Mm-hmm. And so one day we can see that we might be able, but we have to see it first. We have to see it. And if you don't see it, you keep wishing that this is going to change. Oh, I'm sorry to death. I wish more you got to eat. Okay? You have to eat. I'm thirsty. You have to drink water. Mm-hmm. You can't wish you're going to. You can't wish you put gas in your tank. You don't put gas in. You wish it's in that tank or car's going to run out of gas. And that's where America is today. We're about to run out of gas if we haven't already. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And how would you fix it? You would step back and bring in the best ethical, peaceful minds, academic and otherwise on the planet. And maybe they can come up with a plan if it's not too late. You know, but Obama's like, not doing that. He's huh? not bringing in the best ethical minds. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who said he was going to fix it, dude? See, we always keep looking for a blame. Who said he was going to fix it? Huh? Mm-hmm. Huh? I mean, Obama. He president. did. He did when he campaigned. Huh? Well, he he said it when he campaigned. There's a whole lot of people that say things. I told Neiman Marcus I'm going to pay him. <laughs> When I got forty six thousand dollars worth of stuff, they still calling me. <laughs> <laughs> so they're just words. But one, you know, I know you spoke at Troy, Troy Davis's uh, funeral, yes. and yesterday the, the go- governor of Oregon said he's not going to uh, have any more executions on his watch. Yes, I. That's a good thing. Well, let me tell you, not just Roy Davis. See, I really didn't believe they was going to kill Roy Davis. I, as sick as America is, I, I didn't realize he was that sick. Why did, you, why did you think they wouldn't? Because of the millions of letters, the Pope's voice, mm-hmm. ethical, moral people stood up and said, no, there's too much doubt about this here. Mm-hmm. The people, the guy that used to run the electric chair in Georgia said there's too much doubt. Mm-hmm. I thought they wouldn't. Mm-hmm. So I went and spoke, well, I spoke at his funeral after, but I spoke at the rally that Friday, and then I left and went to Huntsville, Texas, and, and we had a group that fasted all night and, and meditated. That brought the guy, one of the guys who who pulled off one of the most hideous hate crimes, mainly because we had TV, we could see it, and that was James Byrd. Right. And we went there and stood out there and said he shouldn't die. And killing is wrong. And I had a senator, a congressman, about three weeks ago. I was going in to testify at a, at a congressional hearing. And the congressman was getting off the elevator. I was getting on. He came back. He said, excuse me, Dick Gregory, can I hug you? He said, when I saw you standing there in front of this evil racist saying he shouldn't be executed, up until then, I'd always been for capital punishment. And thanks to you, I'm not now. Wow. I had another guy tell me at the the, 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 the take back D.C. movement, a white guy. He said, I just flew in from Oregon. And, Mr. Perry, thank you. I really believe that Troy Davis should have lived, and I believe that those guys that killed James Burr should die. And now, after seeing you, I don't believe nobody should. See, the electric chair is this. If, if, if I do a hideous crime and you give me life in jail, that's that's punishment. Once you give me a capital pun, that's revenge. Mm-hmm. There's something wrong with that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we Christians cry over the crucifixion of Christ <laughs> and be for capital punishment. I, Jesus was killed. He wasn't mugged to death or run down by some drunken chair driver. The state killed Jesus. Mm-hmm. How can you sing what you there? When they crucified the Lord, which is a cheap song to sing 2,000 years later, we wasn't there then and most of us wouldn't be there now. And if Jesus Christ came back to America and bugged the wrong people, they'd give him the electric chair. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then we'll all be walking around with big chairs around our neck. But you can ask the most insane person in the world. And about 90% of them would get it right if 
my little trifling cousin who can't read or write Jabbo jokes, in and out of jail. If he came to L.A. today and went in the Hilton Hotel and killed 12 white folks, you know uh, he's going to die. If Prince Charles' his son came over here and went in the same hotel and killed 40 white folks, he's not going to get elected yet. Mm-hmm. That don't seem to bother people. The in- so. inconsistencies and the injustice, how it's applied. But it seems to have bothered the governor of Oregon because he says he can't, he won't allow any more executions in his state. Well, that's good. That's and, good. And, and little by little, and I'm sure, and that's what I said about the yeah. the, uh, the Troy Boy Davis, Davis trial. Exactly. See, I always believe that if we could get somebody to agree that was going to get the lecture chair, yeah. is would you agree that they can do this on TV and let the world see what happened? Mm-hmm. But, no, that wouldn't have been effective if Troy Davis because the people heard all the inconsistencies in this here, and that did more to end capital punishment in the long run than, than anything else. Right. And in your sermon, you said God, in your, when, in your speech at his funeral, you said God leaves no footprints. So this governor, does, that's the footprint, not yeah, the Yeah, well, left. you see, when God picks you, hmm? mm-hmm. It leaves no footprint. You don't have to turn on NBC or CBS or, or, or look up in the archives. You were picked. And who cares who knows your name? You've already been picked by the universal. There's no footprints that need to be left. And, and, and so consequently, we will see things change fast, but I don't know if we waited too long. Uh-huh. If we waited too long. You know, when you sit and you look at the at at the the, the, the what happened in uh, at, at, at University of California, right? When you look at, you got to go back and study that. I called a researcher of mine, and I said, I'll have my wife send you these films. Study it real good, and look and see what you see, and then fly in after Thanksgiving, list it down and discuss it. Did you see those pictures? Yes, I did. Of course. Right now. No, no, I didn't ask you, of course. I just asked you, did you see them? Oh, well, I mean, who couldn't? I mean, yes, yes. No, 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 no. See, once you give me emotions, then you miss it. Oh. Did you see the pictures? Yes. Right. Now you saw the cops spray it. Are you aware that that was military spray he was using? Mm -hmm. That was no good. That was was different from what we see in in the civil streets, right? Mm Mm-hmm. You have to have special training to use that, right? So now you saw him spraying. Well, here's the problem. You're aware that those students, those students sitting there, they was not chained. You're aware of that. They weren't tied to each other. Right. right? And they weren't handcuffed. You're aware of that. Right. All right. Do you know what that do to a cop when I hit you with my best stuff and you don't flinch? You don't cuss me, huh? You don't holler and scream. That's why. Look at that. Look at his the way he marched up there. What do you mean you're not making noise? Do you know who I am? Huh? <laughs> and now, only God bless you citizens in California when them lawsuits start coming in. <laughs> you think tuition has gone up now? Uh-uh. It's really going to go up. Wait till those lawsuits with them good lawyers y'all got out there. Wait till they go in and watch the settlements out of court, okay? And so when you look at what those cops was doing, see, they could have did that to Puerto Ricans and Mexicans and black folks, and they could have got away with it. (laughs) But you're not going to do it. See, the war ended in Vietnam, for you young folks out there, with all the thousands of folks that was marching against the war, what ended the war was Kent State. Hmm? They went up there and shot those children down like they was rabbits. They did that before. They did it in two black colleges. Huh? They did it in two black colleges. <laughs> they made the news one day and saw. And what they found out at Kent State, they, they brought the National Guard out. We'll teach them a lesson. And they had one of the National Guardsmen was dressed like a student. He was in the ranks. He pulled out a gun and shot at the National Guard. The National Guard didn't know it, and they shot back. The students chased the shooter. He ran right to the National Guard, and they opened up and let him in. 
because some folks knew that was planned. And then when they shot them children down in the world, looked at white children being shot down. That ended the war in 1968 when Mayor Daley and them thug Democrats thought they would be able to explain to the Republicans, we just as hard on crime as you are. And then white students came in there to demonstrate, and them white people came in from all over, and they closed off Lincoln Park. In other words, if you and I are cops and we got 30,000 people, you can't arrest all of them. So you create what you call a funnel. You, 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 you leave an opening so when you drop your tear gas, people can run to that opening and get out of there, and then you pick off the leaders. They put a ring around the park with no opening when I dropped that tear gas. Anywhere I ran, I had to bump into a cop. That's why I go down in history as a police ride, and it backfired on the Democrats, huh? And so people looking at white children getting beat up by cops. They've seen this. Why do you think with the thousands of black cops in America, why do you think you never read the news or pick up TV and see a white family crying every other day? Oh, this, this Negro cop uh, shot my husband or my brother, my sister in the back of the head 40 times. Why do you think you don't see? You think better cops? You think black cops are better trained or more spiritual? No. Black cops got enough sense to know the white folks ain't going to tolerate it. And when you get to the point you don't tolerate nothing, it stops. And so, and so consequently, as black people, I'm a black man and one of the wide hip black dudes on the planet, baby. And I ain't never heard a black man come to me and say that white racist cop took his nightstick and hit my car. I don't know if you can find a black man in America that say a white cop hit his car because there's something in that white boy's spirit that he know you can kill my mama, my brother, my child. Don't mess with my car. Huh? Whew, it's kind of. Huh? Well, you know, Steve, and I know my listeners are looking for answers. They want answers. Baby, let me tell you something. My oldest son, I have ten children, right? And my oldest son, Gregory, I've got one daughter is the bureau chief for all sex crimes and murders in all of Brooklyn. I've got another daughter who have two PhDs in, in sex harassment at the workplace from the London School of Economics, and if she came to testify for you, there's nobody they can bring in because right now she's organized as the only authority on the planet. I tell you that <laughs> because all my children are brilliant. Mm -hmm. My oldest son called me one day and said, Dad, you got to come to Dallas. I'm hooked to crack. I said, I can't help you, son. I said, I never smoked a reefer. And don't call your mother. She never drank a beer, of which he said to me, Dad, Dad, you go all over the world helping people. I said, son, stop your emotions. If the doctor would have told you you had a brain tumor, you would not call me to Dallas to cut your head open. Okay? <laughs> so I'm saying to you now, what qualifies your listeners to change something just because they listen? Huh? <laughs> I can listen to your show every day. That do quite qualify to be a brain surgeon until I go take the training and know all the facilities. That's why we always want a cheap way out, and that's why it's not going to work. America, do not bring you into the military and send you to the front line the first day, and if you're not up to snuff, they will get you out. It's called full F, okay? <laughs> you cannot go to Notre Dame or UCLA football team and just because you want to play football, you play. But when it comes, not a game, but real life, you know, let anybody, just let anybody call in my, 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 listen, the people that can solve it, you know. There are people out here that solve it. Go look for them. Huh? When something happened to your car, huh? mm -hmm. you go find people who know how to work on an engine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Huh? If your baby choked to death and start choking, you run and take it someplace that can go down there and get that, that quarter out and swallow it. Well, that's why I came to you. Because okay. I'm, I'm think you've been, you've gone to the. Yeah, table. I would not waste my time <laughs> when I go to, to <laughs> seminars. Look, if you had a show today mm, <laughs> on how we're gonna get to Mars, right? Yeah. With your intelligence, you'd bring scientists in, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You wouldn't bring just some street people off the street. Well, why don't you do it when it comes to the human problem? Mm -hmm, huh? mm -hmm. 
if you was going to talk about, huh, why arthritis creates one, you wouldn't just get somebody with arthritis. They don't know. Mm-hmm. You bring people in and tell you, people who's been trained, people who's, then you will come up with some solutions. Okay, so what we're saying, what I'm understanding, there's no will to solve it. There's no will to solve it because everything, when when Kennedy said we're going to put uh, uh, astronauts up there in the, in the space, didn't they do it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> did they come on the street and beg people, give me some ideas, or did they go and get billions and trillions down to the universities and to the scientists? Did so, the Russians just come out in the street yeah. and say, because we, okay, then, then, you see, we're so disrespectful when it comes to something we really don't want to do because mm-hmm. in our heart we don't want to see it change. Mm-hmm. You know, do you know what the, the uh, let me tell you what the, the Senate and Congress did the other day. President Obama and his wife went out and campaigned for nutrition in schools, okay? Mm-hmm. And they said uh, ketchup is not a vegetable hmm? and pizza is not a nutritionist meal. And French fries has no nutritional value in it. And for those of you who listen, if you believe that French fries and pizza and and ketchup is all that good, then when y'all go out to meet with the family tomorrow for Thanksgiving dinner, see if you have pizza. (laughs) See, see see, See if you have French fries, huh? So here's what happened. So he got it. Executive order. And then a bill came up, Uh a money bill, and the lobbyists came to the Senate and Congress folks and said, we need you to do this. So they decided that they would not push the bill through to run this government for the next month unless that part came out. Well, let me tell you, pizza is a multi trillion dollar business, it's a multi-billion dollar business in the schools. Pizza that you come to your school, they've been in a warehouse for 18 months to two years. You see, with 53 million people eating lunch in schools, you can't make them pizzas last week. they in the warehouse frozen ketchup. They said they end up saying two teaspoons of ketchup is, is equivalent to a, a cup of fresh vegetables. That's what them thugs did to our children. And you know the sad part about it? Hitler, as vicious as he was, there is no evidence that he would have let that happen to German children. He might have did it to Jews. Mm-hmm, hmm? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I doubt if he would have done it to German children. Mm-hmm. These thugs in Washington, D.C., just let money folks come in mm-hmm. and decide for our children that this is what you will have for lunch. Who cares about you? This is America. And you know you always have this whole thing where go around, come around. Well, Americans should stop saying that because one day it's going to come. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. You always said, we always said, you, you reap what you want. So, well, but we know I told know. this mess. Right. If I go plant me a watermelon and put a cucumber seed in, it's going to be cucumbers that come up, not watermelon. Mm-hmm. And all of this stuff, just like you plant a seed. You ever seen them one of the little big watermelon seeds? Mm-hmm. And you plant it, and it comes over this big watermelon. All this hatred, meanness, and nastiness, if we plant it in our spirit, that one day we might find out where the tumors come from. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, saw, my, I saw a video of you talking about the food sources and, you know, I, yes. I, I hear you. And that's something that you spoke to about what we should be aware of. But as you said, as getting back to the will, there's no will. But, you know, I didn't ask you, do you feel like taking callers? Because I got the phone. Oh, yeah, please. I, let's take some callers. Let's take Brandon from Alabama. Hi, Brandon. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, God Debbie. bless you. How's it going? God bless you. Your name is London? Brandon. Brandon, sorry. Well, happy holiday to you and your family and all of your neighbors. Thank you much for calling. Thank you. Um, I was wondering two things. Um, first of all, do you still live in Chicago? Oh, no, no. I've been living in Plymouth, Massachusetts since 1973. Oh, okay. Because yes. I was going to ask you about Rahm Emanuel. But um, 
secondly, I love what you said about what comes around goes around, because yeah. the second thing I wanted to ask is the idea that America is losing its um, place in the world, that it is diminishing. America what always has. This happened. This didn't happen on the Bush's watch or Obama's watch. This happened 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The decline. You know, they said that the rise in and decline of the Roman Empire. Well, maybe we should read that and you find out before it went down the point blank, it started declining. It's a 50-year decline. Mm-hmm. That go. Remember, when the baby is born, you didn't just get pregnant today. <laughs> yes. mm-hmm. America is almost like a... You ever been driving down the highway and, 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 and see this dead skunk and you smell it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have you? Well, I have. Okay, yeah, well, well, but but the skunk is dead. You smell the stink. Don't mistake the stink for life. America is like the dead skunk on the highway. Mm-hmm. And I'm not somebody that bash America. I stake my life into trying to turn this thing around. So all y'all want the easy way out and say he just don't like America. If right. you could put online what Dick Gregory had put online to change this country, then maybe you can sit at the table and talk to me. But I examine it, and it's just like a doctor. You examine it, you look at it, and you say, okay, here's the prognosis. Well, what can we do? And the doctor looks at you and says, it's too late. Yeah, so that's your answer. See, because I asked you, what can we do? And you say the doctor says it's too late. No, yeah, but it's too late. But in, in the process, do you realize the church, right, the, the Catholic Church picked their first Polish pope, remember? Mm-hmm. And 1.5 million white folks left the church. <laughs> I never heard no white person walking out of a whole house because a Polish dude walked in. <laughs> I didn't know that stat. Huh? I didn't know that stat. <laughs> because they chose a Polish pope? Yeah, all you do is t- type it up on the computer there. When, when, when the pope before this one was Polish, when he was inaugurated, 1.5 million white folks left the church. We're not talking about a whole house or a football game or a bullfight, okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if that institution is that corrupt, what do you think about all the rest of them? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, Thank you, ma'am, gonna, for calling. We're going to take another caller. Do we have Leo on the line? Hello? No, we do not. Oh, we miss Leo. Okay, well, I mean, he he... You you say there's no hope. There is no will. You know, even when there's no hope, you still keep fighting, but you have to know it. You've got force fighters, huh? Mm-hmm. You live in California, and force fighters go out there. Let me tell you what I've heard when I was little. So I didn't live in California, so I didn't know about no force fighters. But I used to always listen. We didn't have TV. We had the radio. Mm-hmm. And they talk about the raging fires and the wind. And then you hear the governor say, if we don't, Get a shift in the wind. We can't save it. Hmm? And now I'm 80 years old, and I never remember reading where a state burnt down. What do shift in the wind mean? It's out of our hands. We have no control over it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what we got to look for now is a shift in the wind. That comes from the universal God force. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The universal God force. When you go home today, no, don't go home. Just on, on the way to where you're going to stop by. Uh, go to a drugstore and go to the uh, the uh, the toothpaste section and pick up the toothpaste and, mm-hmm. and get the real the real big ones so the, the print and it says if you swallow warning if you swallow uh, a, a tea sized piece of this one of the little bitty green peas mm-hmm. call not your doctor not go to the emergency ward call the poison control center that's <laughs> in your toothpaste okay. That's what these thugs put in the toothpaste. How do children take toothpaste that's sweet and not know that it's not candy, okay? This is America. Hmm? This is a game they play, huh? Do they Why do you think you cannot go and buy moth lick in a white neighborhood, or did you know that? I, oh, my gosh. Hmm? You mean to tell me on the toothpaste they say call poison control? At, do you, do, is there somewhere in the studio, real quick, that has some toothpaste? All you got to do is read the label. <laughs> Hmm? <laughs> it says, call the poison control center, okay? Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's there. Hmm? And so, when I said, like I said, 
Did, did you know that you cannot buy malt liquor in the white neighborhood? No, I didn't know that. Because they got a thing in it called manganese, right? And once you get enough manganese, you'll kill your mama. And then people wonder about this violence in the black community. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. Okay, this uh, Coca-Cola is in court now, federal court. Um, when soda pop, you know, there's an expiration date on all soda pop. Mm -hmm. And once it reached that date, you're supposed to throw it away. Well, some black folks and some white folks been working for Coca-Cola for years. They decided to blow the whistle, and they said, well, what we've been doing is they have us take up all these expired Coca-Colas from the white community stores and take them to a warehouse in northern Dallas mm -hmm. and redate them and take them to the black community. And so if my mama was alive and she drank one, she said, <clears throat> I got to go see the doctor. There must be something wrong with me every time I drink one of these cokes. I get heartburned. They never blame it on the coke. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying, if Coca Cola is doing that, you think the pharmaceutical companies might be doing that too? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's the whole, the whole corporatization thing. of America. Yeah, and that's what these young folks is talking about. And did you see when the president said he's going to bring the soldiers home from Iraq mm -hmm. by Christmas? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was something wrong with that picture. Did you notice when he was standing there, there was no general standing next to him? No, I didn't notice that. That's not protocol. You know what he's bringing them soldiers home for? What? The occupiers. Okay? Oh. You know, if we've been in Iraq for eight years, you know how many trillions of dollars worth of equipment we have there? So how are you going to bring the soldiers home in two months? What are they going to do, leave the equipment? Ah, there's my music. But you know what? I want to ask you to come on as a guest again because I want to investigate, examine this thing about the food source. I think this is very important. I know what's going on with Monsanto poisoning us. All you have to do is call my wife. She runs my schedule, and I will gladly do it. And I have her number. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Happy I'm, holidays. I'm so grateful. Happy holidays to you and yours, too. Thank you, Mr. Much. Gregory, thank you very much. This is the Kathleen Wells Show. I want to say thank you, listeners, for listening. We had a very interesting conversation. I want to continue it. Yes, we are being poisoned by Monsanto and other organizations, other corporations, poisoning our food, and we want to get into that. So um, thank you, listeners. This is the Kathleen Wells Show. And uh, come back next week. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Bye-bye.